Hey, welcome back to another episode of Armchair Architects as part of the Azure Enablement Show. Today, we're going to talk about data, but not just any data. We're going to talk about this phenomenon called dark data. And what do you do about it? I hadn't heard about this until I get a chance to talk to these architects, and it was super cool to learn about it and to understand what I had to, had to pay attention to. So I hope you'll join us. Um, be sure to check out the links below and subscribe, and let's go find out about dark data. Let's go talk to our architects. Hey, welcome back, uh, Eric. Welcome back, Uli. Um, it's delightful to talk to you. I think it's time we talk about data. Um, and in particular, I want to talk about this thing that I think people are using to scare children at night um, when they want them to go to bed or something. They talk about dark data. Um, but I don't actually perhaps know what dark data means. I know I, I used to know what big data means, but apparently there's this, this concern that big data is turning into dark data. So can we just get the, the dark data question out, out onto the table first? What do we mean when we say dark data? And then, then we can dive into this more, more fully. Yeah, so I, I think I mentioned in another session where um, a, a customer of mine leaned back from the table and said, I'm not getting a lot out of this big data platform. I, I know we spent a lot of money on it. I know we're ingesting hundreds of thousands of transactions and messages per second. It's going into this weird thing called a data lake, and now there are data marts and whatever happened to warehouses. Is anybody actually benefiting from this thing? Um, and, or is the data locked up in specific data files or formats or schemas or repositories and silos which can never be conceivably joined together in a useful way within the right time frame, And so the question says, you know, that, that many customers end up asking is, well, I know the data is there because we have system X, system Y, and system Z generating these transactions. So right. it's got to be going somewhere. If you're telling me it's all going to the lake, where is it? And how come I can't touch it? So the dark data element is we know that it's there, but we just can't access it. We can't see it. And it's going to take a significant effort to actually unearth it and then to get business value out of it. Meanwhile, these companies are spent and these organizations are spending a lot of money to keep the lights on from the hypervisors to the storage, uh, the network and compute required to maintain this data lake, uh, or more importantly, what we come to know as a data swamp, right? Which is, I can't actually ever get through this thing in order to get anything valuable out of it. Well, is that your definition as well of dark data? Yeah. It's effectively, you collect data and a lot of times you have no idea what this is for, why are you doing it? There is no value. Uh, the data swamp is actually a good piece where people wade into it and they've never been seen again because there's um, kind of a nebula running around and uh, it's foggy and whatnot. So it ultimately is you collecting data, spending money on it and you don't get any value out of it or very little. And that's really what happens to a lot of companies when they do big data projects. Um, and the way I think about this is it often gets, the technology gets put ahead of the usage. Um, so people are investing in data lake technology and big data processing, whatever technology you use, it doesn't really matter. Uh, it's a similar beef I have with people that are doing DevOps. They think about the tool chain and they don't think about the uh, discipline, the culture that you have to change and stuff like that. And the same is true with data. Um, let me give you an example from Microsoft's past. Um, so Bing and Google, um, Google was winning very clearly and is still the big dog in the um, search business. But Bing is a sizable business by now. It's, I think, 34 or 5% of the U.S. market or something like that, which is pretty, pretty big. And in 2007... Uh, the teams were effectively trying to out-Google Google is the way I call it. So the brute forcing and stuff like that. And we got a new lead in uh, and he came in and said, we can't do this. This is just, that makes no sense. Uh, what we need to figure out is how do we become more relevant? So the key thing in search is the relevant score. So whatever you do, the first three links better meet uh, what people are looking for. Otherwise, it's not interesting. So he invested in the first data lake, the big data system at Microsoft. We didn't have one before. We had data warehouses and other things, but not a big data system. And that system is called Cosmos. And the idea was that we collect signals from the Bing system, the user behaviors and stuff like that. And we have data scientists, which was a new discipline at Microsoft at that time, that go and roam this data Cosmos 
um, and figure out what are the patterns and how do we improve the um, reliability score or relevance score in search. That was the only thing that these guys were supposed to do, nothing else and so forth. And everything was collected with this in mind. And I think once you have a business objective, you know what you want to achieve, then I think big data can work. There's another great example with ThyssenKrupp elevators, which we made public years ago. And these guys came in with a lot of data from 20 years of elevator maintenance. Um, and they asked, can we use this data to answer some basic question, which was the person that maintains the elevator generally comes with the wrong part because they don't necessarily know what's going on with the part. So they uh, come and, oh, damn, I have the wrong part. They have to go back, get the right part, and that's expensive. Or the other question they ask is, hey, because we don't really know what um, our customer or what these elevators need, we overstock the forward deployed uh, parts de um, depo deposits. And so that costs a lot of money. Um, and so can you help us with that? And the last one was a little bit um, around um, expert help. But these two pieces about what parts are generally broken and what parts do we need um, we could actually help them with the data they had collected. But because they knew what they wanted to achieve, the data was available, the queries or the machine learning was used to answer these questions. If you have no questions you're going to answer that you know you want to answer, no data will be ever sufficient to effectively help you answer those, uh, those non-questions because you collect data, but you don't know what the outcome is. Uh, it's not going to be successful. So I get the sense that in addition to, I think that's probably the biggest thing that happens that people like like our technology for first, right? I, I often say like leading with technology is a little bit like having a bad cab driver. Um, you know, you may get to where you're going, but you're gonna spend a lot more money than you expect and you're not gonna enjoy the experience, right? Like, and you're probably gonna, you're probably gonna not go very directly, right? Um, so I wonder, however, if, the, if it's not just, the, it, it, in addition to the like not being super clear about what the goal is, let's assume you're pretty clear about the goal. Um, but I've seen big data things go awry, not just because people didn't know what they were doing or what they thought about they're doing, even if, or they picked the wrong technology. I get the sense that there are, are patterns that are also can can lead you into the into the dark data space. That sounds uh, something. So, like, what are some of those patterns that 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 get you to to this place that you don't want to be in that we're calling dark data? Yeah, so let, let's assume that you have an ROI statement. If I get this data and I can make decisions, then I will retrieve, I will receive this, this value, uh, right. whether that's in terms of dollars and cost savings or what have you. The patterns associated with that mean that you actually have to have a big data platform or system or what it, whatever it is that makes it easy to retrieve, to ask questions and to have those questions answered in a timely fashion. Right. So typically in big data platforms and those the organizations have become kind of jaded with, they are rife with ETL jobs, schema on write jobs in which you pick the data up, you move it around and you plop it down and you change it a little bit. You take some of that same data from a different source, you pick it up, you move it over here, you plop it down and change it again a little bit. And now you have two truths. Some of them might be true in cer certain circumstances and some of them might be true in another circumstance. My whole goal is to try to free our customers from having to manage these brittle and fragile ETL pipelines and to apply a schema on read methodology with contextual bits of information that allows you to fuse data together from multiple sources and is basically going to build a bigger picture as you run the query. Now, the question becomes, well, hey, all that sounds fantastic. Well, how do you actually do that in practice? Right. Uh, for me, separating the model, the entities, attributes, and relationships from the data storage paradigm, but making their um, strict you know, mappings so that we understand where the data exists is super important. So certainly that means you have to have a big data platform that's sharded, that's indexed, uh, that's partitioned correctly. But then having table definitions and entities and relationships that sit on top of that and point to where the data lives and then having the, that model, if you will, be human readable, human understandable, right. that actually allows you to have this schema on read assemblage uh, fusion kind of methodology on top of the data sets. Again, ETL, ELT, I think we have had those patterns for quite some time. 
Um, and nothing wrong with what you said, but it's a bit old fashioned um, because there's a lot of people that are now saying, do I need even schema? Because I'm actually not having humans read it. So if eventually you get to the human side, sure, I need schema. But if you're using uh, AI on top of your big data, uh, the big data, the AI system doesn't necessarily need schema. Uh, they can run through this pattern detection and so forth. So I would say that the big question is always still, what's the business outcome you're trying to achieve? What is going on? Then make sure that the data you collect is managed properly. What that means is secured, um, accessible or not, uh, then from a cost perspective, have a hierarchical storage architecture because if you store lots of data, it can also still, the, the prices for storage is cheap, but if you have lots of data, it's not that cheap anymore. Um, and then be able to say, yes, have the right pattern. ETL does work in certain scenarios. ELT is more flexible because you can use the extracted data for many purposes, not just one. Uh, because once you do ETL, you ultimately have the shape of the um, data already predefined, which also means you generally have the questions you, that the shape can answer predefined. Um, and then you effectively go and into a more flexible model with ELT. And then think about AI as part of your equation to say, hey, I know some queries. That's where um, Eric's model works. But some pieces of data, I just, I don't even know what the value is. Let the AI system go through it and detect patterns that we haven't seen before. Okay, somebody out there is going nuts because we have not, and including perhaps me, because we've not defined ETL and ELT. Would you just expand mm -hmm. your acronyms, Mr. Holman? So um, normally you have a source system where you extract data for analytics. And that's the E. Then you say, okay, there's a transform that says the source data is in this shape, but I want my target data, the Power BI application or the Tableau uh, system needs a certain shape of data so that I can visualize it, for example. So I need to transform that data. And then there is a load, an L portion. So you load it into the target system, be that a data lake, be that a visualization tool or whatever it might be. And so you can now say, I extract. And when, as part of the passing, I transform and then load, that means you have a fairly fixed shape. Or you say, hey, I'm going to extract. I'm just dumping it, loading it into the data lake. And then I transform potentially many times from the source data. Because for one scenario, I might have this shape. Another scenario, I might have net that shape. And for me, ELT generally wins these days because storage is ultimately cheap and people want to use data for multiple purposes in the ideal case. Um, and the other piece they, uh, Eric mentioned is a source of truth. Again, the, I always be uh, in my conversations with clients and customers, I talk about, look, if you manage nuclear uh, arsenal, you want to have one source of truth and it needs to be precise and everything because you don't want to lose those nukes. I think that's, that makes a single source of truth absolutely true, necessary. Otherwise, there's a lot of fuzziness in the business anyway. And it's okay to be not having the single source of truth model, um, which sometimes is really hard to reach because there is multiple data sets and they have value. It's not about truth, it's about value. And again, Thinking that through how you distinguish between value and quote unquote truth um, is an interesting exercise for uh, the people that model data, that think about data. Okay, I have to say that I wanna sit and ponder the philosophical nature of multiple sources of truth or multiple truths or, or whatever. But um, I wanna ask you one final question because we're coming really, really to the end here and I'm hoping you can answer it in a sentence or two at most. Um, is it possible to go from a place where congratulations, I find myself in the dark with dark data to a place where to come back to a place of where it's useful, where we're back into happy big data land and we're actually happy now um, without, without pushing the just the, like without pulling a ripcord and, and making a second system. Um, is it possible to go from uh, good to bad to good again? It's, it's possible through tooling practices, discipline, and governance. 
That's my sentence. That's good. What's your sentence, Julie? Adding to that, think about the business outcome up front. Okay, I'll take it. Um, thank you once again, Eric and Uli, for uh, having us talk about some really cool stuff. And I look forward to talking to you more here. Um, and thank you all for watching here on Armchair Ar yeah, here on Armchair Architects, where pronunciation is king. Bye now. Thank, thank you. you.